For the introduction to my class, I thought I would do an introduction because there are some people in this classroom that may not, uh, in fact, know who I am. So um, I'll, just, I'll just start. Uh, I am Pat Weber. My wife, Angie, is uh, over there in the corner somewhere, hiding her head so that nobody knows which one is attached to me. Um, Angie and I have been members here at, uh, at Riverwalk for about the last three years. Um, so the short version of our story is that uh, Angie Williams at the time grew up here at Central. And when I met her in college, I began attending her when we began dating. And then, in fact, um, we got married in this church. So you look at this picture, and you'll notice some things. I'm pretty sure those are the same pews that are in the auditorium now. If you look, that's the same lights that's in the auditorium now. In the background, you can see the same baptistry back in the back there. Looks good. I'm pretty sure it's the same carpet. The only thing that is not the same um, is uh, that couple that's in the middle. I don't know where that young couple went to, but I'd like to meet them because um, I'm sure they're very interesting. But uh, after we got married, we moved away for a number of years. We, uh, we wound up coming back to Wichita after a number of years away. We, we actually attended another church here in town for, uh, for a while. And then we found our way back here to Riverwalk. So I know many of you here in the room, but I would say there's probably a fair number here that either I haven't spoken to or I haven't met or I don't know. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because just yesterday I was having a conversation with, with a new member. I, I met her for the first time and we were talking about this and, and she went over exactly what I was going to say at this point because it is so true and, and we all recognize this. The reason why I may not know some of you is it's geographical, right? So I have to admit, I am a right-sider, okay? So over in my little section, I'm pretty happy in my world in the auditorium over on the right side. I'm not leaning left, Curtis, okay? So today, I mean, it was like teeny tiny over there. I mean, I had to look all the way across. No. Um, so I am a right sider. So when I look around in my little area, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable. I know who's supposed to be there. I keep track of who's supposed to be there. But I know in this room there are several middlers and maybe even some left siders here. And, and you know, what I, what I know will normally do is at some point during, you know, the worship, I'll probably look around the room you know, take the lay of the land, try to figure out, you know, maybe just numbers of people that are there, maybe kind of take the pulse of what's going on. But I don't know down to the person who's supposed to be there. And, and really, especially, you know, that whole Parnell section, I, I don't know hardly anything about it other than I need a passport to go visit over there. So, <laughs> so you know, that's, that's kind of the way this all works. But... Um, this is a little bit some of what we're going to talk about over the next two weeks, because not only am I here this week, we'll see how many of you come back for next week. But um, no, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to try to convince you to change where you sit in the auditorium. I know that, that you have the cushions just the way you love them now, so you can still continue to sit in your same seats. But uh, what we are going to discuss are maybe some of the unintended consequences that have happened from living in a church in the modern world and some of the conveniences that we have adopted along the way. So in order to do some of that, um, we're going to start off by taking a look at the health of the church, all right? But you have to do some work, all right? So first of all, around your tables, you're going to have to talk to each other. I know this is a scary proposition, but you will have to do this. There are three questions here that I would like you to discuss amongst your group. The first is, what do you think is the largest faith group or religion in the United States today? Okay, and if you can figure out which one is the largest one, the second question is, 
which of the faith groups in the United States are growing and which of the faith groups are contracting or shrinking. And then the last question is, why do you think that is? Why do you think that the growing groups are growing and why are the shrinking groups shrinking? All right. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do that just around their table. And don't, don't get too concerned, okay? You won't have to speak aloud unless you want to, but do be prepared to give some of the answers that your table comes up with. So I'm going to turn the class over to you, and I will say, ready, go. <laughs> All right. If I could have your attention back here, please. Thank you so much for playing along. That was excellent. I heard uh, as I kind of wandered around, I saw that there were a lot of great discussions going on. Um, so before we get into all that, I need to tell you about something about what it is that I'm going to talk about so that Jay knows finally what it is that I'm going to talk about in my class. Um, I read this book um, a couple of years ago now. It was called Church Reset by a guy named Jack Wilkie. And as I read that book and I read others, I've, I've read about some ideas about some things that maybe we could do better as a church. And it made me think about these issues. Now, I'm just going to tell you um, at the end of this week and at the end of next week, I'm not going to have a lot of answers for you. But hopefully what I will give you is I will give you the same things that I've been thinking about for you to think about and for us to maybe begin discussions amongst us in the church. And, and that's really because I don't have the answers. All I can tell you is that over the last couple of years, I've been thinking about the things that I've read and I've been praying about those things, trying to figure out where we need to go and what we need to do. And some of what I'm getting ready to show you is the reason why we probably need to do that. But just be prepared because I don't have the answers for you. We're going to have to think through that, and hopefully you will start your own journey of thinking about it and praying about it. So the first question that we talked about today, all right, just throw out some, some ideas to me. What did your table come up with? What is the largest faith group in the United States today? Okay, I heard Christianity. I heard Catholic here. Catholic, okay. Pentecostal, okay. All right. Non-denominational, okay. Excellent. All of these are excellent, excellent questions. And all of them are actually, in some way, shape, or form, the right answer, okay. So, here's the second part of what's getting ready to happen. I'm getting ready to flood you with data, all right. So um, the data that I'm going to show you comes from the latest Pew Research poll on uh, the, the status of religion, basically. They do an annual poll on the status of religion in the United States. And so I'm getting ready to throw up a bunch of numbers. But I have to tell you, I come from Western Kansas. Now, in Western Kansas, we are a naturally suspicious people, all right? <laughs> My father told me because his father told him that figures lie and liars figure. <laughs> and here I am getting ready to show you a bunch of figures, all right? So I want to tell you that it's okay if you want to take them with a grain of salt because I do that too. Um, but I do think that based on anecdotal evidence, and, and based off of the numbers that you're going to see, that I don't think we can throw the baby out with the bathwater with these numbers. I think we, we have to take them seriously, especially regarding the trends we might be seeing within the religious thoughts of what's going on um, here in this country, generally, because that's where the poll comes from. But I, I will just expand it and say, this is what's happening in the world right now. So. Healthy skepticism, but we need to take a look at it. So, which is the largest United States faith group? Well, according to Pew Research, if you look here at the top number here, it says that 64% of the 
of the respondents to the Pew poll still associated themselves with some form of Christianity. All right? And that included all of the denominations that you gave to me. So you were all right on track with, with what they were talking about. Now, down at the bottom of this poll, or actually here in the middle, it says other faiths. Okay? So the other faiths, when we talk about other faiths, we're talking about Jewish, Muslim, Hinduism, Buddhism, those get grouped into other faiths, okay? And that is at 7% right now. And then there is this category that's kind of a strange category. These are people that said when they were asked that they have no religious affiliation, okay? Now, what does that mean? Well, what it means is is that they, are either, they have either decided that they are atheist or they are agnostic or they just say, I have no religious affiliation at all and I don't really think about it. All right? And that number, as you can see, is 28%. So that's one third of the country that says they have no religious affiliation. All right, now you may be asking yourself, but where does the Church of Christ fall into this? So, these are the aggregate scores, right? This is, this is the, what is published. You have to dig down into like the bowels of the report to find out where the Church of Christ is going to fit in. And when you look into the Church of Christ, they actually split Protestantism into two broad categories. One is the mainline Protestants. We are not mainline Protestants. That might surprise some of you. Instead, the second category is Evan evangelistic Protest Protestants, and that's where we fall out. We fall out into a subcategory of the evangelistic Protestant category called the Restorationist Movement. So that should probably not catch many of you by surprise. But the number might. The number is, actually, we are 1.5% of the 64% of professing Christians in the country. All right, so that's just some raw numbers right now. Let's take a look at trends, though. All right, so you've discussed around your table the different trends, who's growing, who's shrinking. And so let's take a look at that. In the latest Pew Research poll, it shows that over the years, the number of people professing to be Christians is shrinking. In fact, if you, if you were to look at this a little bit closer, you would see it hovered around about 90% up until the mid to late 80s into the 90s, and then it started on a downward tra trajectory, and now we're down to 64%. All right? So that's the trend for Christians. All right? I'll jump down to the, bottom, uh, to the second line down. These are the nuns, right? These are the people that say they have no religious affiliation. And they're growing almost in an exact inverse relationship to the Christianity shrinking, right? And then the other religions, they're all pretty much remaining about the same. They hover right around about 7%, and that's how they do uh, in all the polling. They just basically hover right around 7%. All right, so who's growing? The nuns. Who's shrinking? People professing to be Christians. And then the others are kind of holding steady. But once again, what about the Church of Christ? How are we doing as our own faith group within a faith group, right? Well, for that, let's just go back and look at some maybe some church history, okay? Um, Although the Restoration Movement started in the 1800s, it wasn't until 1906 that the Churches of Christ were recognized as an independent uh, religious grouping. So in 1906, during the poll, they came out with just over 2,000 churches, 
and uh, uh, about 160,000 members within those churches. If you do the math on that, if we evenly distributed everybody across all those churches, that comes out to about 60 people per church back in 1906. Over the next... What population in 1906? I, I don't know. Okay, over the next 40 years, the next 40 years, that grew. That number quadrupled over the next 40 years. So by 1948... There were just over 10,000 churches, and now we're up to 680,000-ish members, all right? That, if you evenly distributed everybody, that works out to about 68 people per every church in the country. All right. Now, the Church of Christ hit its high watermark in 1985 is where the largest uh, population of Church of Christ um, and the Church of Christ has been in steady decline since 1990. Okay, in 1990 there were just over 13,000 churches and just over about 1.3 million members in the Churches of Christ. But it's been shrinking, okay? And so, um, in 2010, in the poll in 2010, they found that the Church of Christ was probably if we were lumped into all denominations, we would have been the 13th largest denomination. But with numbers of churches, we actually jump up to the seventh largest number of churches, right? Which means we have a whole bunch of tiny churches, right, in the Church of Christ. All right, now, um, by 2021, that number had definitely fallen off. We were down to under 12,000 churches by 2021, and we were down to around a million members in the Churches of Christ. All right, two guys, two smart guys wrote a book, and this was their results of their book. On average, the Churches of Christ are losing nine congregations and 2,000 members every month since 2015. All right. So if you thought perhaps even though Christianity is going this way and the nuns are going this way, but maybe we're bucking the Christianity trend and we're growing, that's not true. We are following the trend line, okay, within the churches of Christ. This is a quote from a book that I read. It says, by two, uh, 2050, we will be one-third the number of churches and members that we were in 1985, our high point. If that occurs, the churches of Christ will have about 4,000 congregations and 400,000 members by 2050. All right, so that's, that's a trend. Well, here's the trend going back to the Pew poll and looking at the big groupings. Here's the trend. Christianity is on a downward trajectory. All right, so this actually takes the numbers and extrapolates them out based on the trend of what is happening. And you can see if nothing changes, that trajectory stays going down, right? So the data shows that people that confess to be Christians are doing what is called switching. This is what the pollsters call it. They are switching. Okay? And what they are doing is they're saying, I'm switching out of being a Christian. So that's what the data shows, is that switching is happening. Here's, here's really what that means for us, is that, first of all, we are not making converts. So people are not becoming Christians. But that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is we are not keeping our children in the church. All right? So this is what's happening is people are switching out of Christianity or switching off Christianity, if that's the way you want to think about it. And that leads directly to the next trend, which is the rise of the nuns, right? Not NUNs, but NONEs. So the nuns are growing, and this can be either unchurched people who have never heard the word and haven't made a decision, but more and more what's happening is th these are Christians that have left the church at any age. And if you look at the end result of this number, by the year 2010, 
I'm sorry, by the year 2070, here's what happens. Christianity contracts down to 46%. And the nuns, for the first time, will be more than the number of professing Christians in this country at 48%. All right. So that's the figures. And I'm trying not to be a liar, right? But that is the data. So we're defining the problem, right? So let's continue to define the problem. So if there is this trend, if Christianity is shrinking and the nuns are rising, we have to figure out why that is happening. So why is it happening? Well, I will tell you this. Everybody's got an opinion. All right? So here's the problem. You can find an expert. OK, who knows what an expert is? Yes, Terry. X is a has-been. A spurt is a drip of water under pressure. So an expert is a has-been drip of water under pressure. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> So I will add just one thing. The expert comes from out of town. That's what makes you an expert, is you bring your opinion to a new place, and that makes you an expert. And the experts will all show up, and they'll all have great ideas for you. Here's what you need to do to fix this. You need to have more programs. You need to change your service so that people will want to come. You need to work on your building and make it more welcoming. You need to do all kinds of things. You need to fire people and hire new people, and, and here's everything that you need to do. And they'll give you all this advice, and then the expert will leave. And so that's what happens with, with an expert. And these are the, all the opinions. I can't tell you all this problem. But once again, what I can boil it down to is this what we know. We are making fewer converts than we were throughout history. All right? We are less evangelical than, than we were once upon a time. All right? so there, there's no other way for us to get around this bare fact is that if we're not making converts, we're, we are less evangelical. So you think about history going all the way back to day zero or day one. Okay, On the day of Pentecost, the church exploded. We were at zero, and then we were at 3,000. Boom! Okay, So that's a 3,000% increase on day one. All right. Over time, it kept growing, it kept growing, it kept growing. There have been several times throughout history there have been these huge explosions. All right. Most recently, we can look at history and we can know that during the 50s, there was a huge explosion in the church of, of all faith groups, not, not just the Church of Christ, but of all faith groups, okay? But there were things that were happening. This, this bump in the 50s lasted until the 60s. It kind of tailed off a little bit. And then in the 70s, believe it or not, when you would think it would never grow, the church began to grow again, and Christianity began to grow again in the 70s. But how did that happen? Well... How many of you remember this, or even know what this is? Jewel Miller. Jewel Miller, who said that? Yeah. So this is the Jewel Miller film strip. I mean, at least you've probably heard the term, the Jewel Miller film strips, right? OK, so there were tools. We can debate whether they were effective tools or not, such as the Jewel Miller film strips that allowed people to have conversations with their neighbors. And at least it allowed a starting point. And by the way, if you want the Jewel Miller film strips, they've digitized them now, and you can get them in digital format. But what I really think we need to ask ourselves is, um, is that the right kind of tool today? Okay. What we really need to do is we need to be spreading the word, and we need to be talking to people about Jesus. But is that the way to do it? Okay. It was one way, and it was one way that seem to be somewhat effective, at least in starting the conversation. But the second problem that we have is, is that our children are leaving the church. So they're either not being convicted while they're in the church, 
or they're not remaining convicted if we ever had them at all. And they're switching out at, at just a huge rate right now. So that's what's happening right now. So both of these probably give you some ideas on things that we may need to do in order to maybe arrest some of these trends. So what we need to ask ourselves is, why is this happening? So I'm going to start with this bold proposal, and this is something that we need to maybe talk about um, even beyond next week when I go through next week's class as well. Could it be that the reason people are switching out of Christianity is because when they look at the church today, they don't see the Jesus that they read about in the Bible, right? So my day job, when I am not here in front of you on Sunday morning, is I work at Flight Safety. And Flight Safety, we train pilots how to fly airplanes, right? And so since I'm at Flight Safety in Wichita, you might guess, I teach people how to fly Cessnas, but other people at Flight Safety here teach them how to fly all the Hawker Beach airplanes and the Learjets. But we teach people how to fly airplanes. But one of my jobs recently has become teaching instructors how to instruct people. So this is, the, this is an idea, this is a study called andragogy, right? The idea of how adults learn, right? And one of the things that we are trying to hammer home with our instructors is this idea, is that if students can't learn through the way that we teach them, maybe we need to teach them in a way that they can learn, is that if people can't learn in the way that you're teaching, you need to change how you're teaching so they can learn. And let me just tell you, we need to adopt that for the church. If people can't see Jesus in the church, we need to become Jesus so that they can see him in the church. Okay, so there's the data, there's the figures. If it's all true and it's fully reliable, it defines the problem pretty well. And it leads to the next question. Has the church today lost its way? Right? Now, this really comes down to this question. What is it that you expect out of church? Right? Because if what you expect out of church is coming together on Sunday morning for three hours to sit in an auditorium for a while and then maybe come to class, and then you kind of put church back into a box and then you go home. It's kind of like, you know, your slippers you put on in the evening when you come home. You know, you put them on, then you take them off. If that's what church is for you, then we're not doing something right. Because this is the real thing. The church was built to be so much more than that. And instead, over time, that is what church has become for way too many people, right? So last week, I was really glad that CJ introduced you to a text that I was going to use in my class, which I am still going to use in my class. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts. Look at Acts starting in verse uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And C.J. was talking last week, and be sure to tell him that he did it so much better than I did, too, when you see him. So, C.J. was talking to you about being a captivating church. And he read exactly this passage, starting in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles, all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All right. So... 
I know you've heard that more than once because you heard it last week when CJ was preaching, but if you've ever looked at that, or maybe this was the first time you've ever heard that passage today, when you hear that, has it ever made you think, why can't it be that way today? You look at all the things that they did, and you say, why can't we do that now? But I'll tell you that probably you're more like me, and instead of asking, why can't it be that way, I make a statement that says, here's why it can't be that way. All right, and here are all my excuses. I'm too busy. I'm too busy for all this nonsense, right? Um, this is not realistic. That is not a realistic expectation of what I should be doing. It's just not realistic, right? Or, okay, so this is just what they did back in the first century. This is just how they live. This is not something that is binding on us today as Christians because that's just the way they did things. And we're different now. Or in all honesty, I'll just tell you, it sounds like a bunch of hippies, right? I mean, let's just be honest. So we got a lot of excuses. And yes, it is true that cultures were different back in the first century. So I'll agree to that last statement to a point that um, there were definitely extreme circumstances when the church was organizing and some of this was necessary just because of all of that turmoil that was taking place at the start of the church as the church was coming together and as the church was building. And I will also tell you that just as CJ said last week, there is scriptural evidence because three chapters later we're talking about Ananias and Sapphira who are dying because they're not giving all their money away that they took in. They couldn't even hold to these ideals back in the first century even though it talks about it. So either it wasn't followed by everybody or they didn't do a great job at following all these different things that they're talking about in chapter 2. So, so some of that may be real, um, but I think we can have a real discussion over whether this is really just a description of how the first century church did it, or whether this is more of a picture of the ideal church of what the church should be and how the church should act. Because when you read it, don't you maybe deep down just a little feel like maybe their example is closer to what God wants for us as a church? Don't you feel like that when you read this, that this is a great example of what things are going to look like when we get to heaven? Right? And when you see it that way, don't some of those excuses that I told you that I use, don't they look more and more feeble at that point? If this is the ideal, why can't we shoot for the ideal? And I do use these excuses. I use them every day. In fact, I'm more apt to use the excuse than to find a reason to help out and to do things. Um, but. Even if we look at it this way, and even if you want to say this is cultural, maybe we should look elsewhere and see if maybe there is other biblical evidence um, that tells us why we don't have to be good hippies to be good Christians, right? So, we don't have to look at Acts 2 anymore. Let's look now at Mark 10. And let's see if Jesus gives us any ideas inside Mark, and Mark 10, starting in verse 28, on how the church should, or what the church should look like. Okay, so just to set the stage here, so this is right after the rich young ruler rejects Jesus' teachings, and then Jesus has this interaction with Peter, and this is what he says. Peter said to him, we have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much 
in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them, persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. All right, so there's, there's a lot of things to unpack here, but really I can sum this all up by telling you that the essential message that Jesus is giving you is that the family that you will receive from following me will be so much better than the blood family that you already have. But this is where we blow it in the modern age, right? Because think about how many different families that you have right now, right? So we refer to our work family. Oh, I have my work family, right? We may have uh, kids or grandkids um, activities family, right? Oh, I have my baseball family or my soccer family or whatever the case may be. We might have our hobby family. I have my golf family or I have my crocheting family or I have my scrapbooking family, whatever the case may be. So that by the time we get down to saying, but I also have my church family, all we're really saying is, yeah, I, I have another group of people that we kind of get together and we share the same interests. And this idea of family has lost its meaning of what a family is supposed to be. Because that's not the idea that Jesus had here in Mark 10. In Mark 10, you need to think about what the importance of family meant in the ancient world. In the ancient world, your family was everything. And Jesus is telling the people here that when you leave everything to follow Jesus that your blessings are going to increase by a hundred times over. And it is a much bigger deal than us thinking about leaving our families today. And how does it do that? Well, when you come together as family in community within the church, we are preparing ourselves to spend eternity with each other, right? And so this spiritual family as we get together, we should fully expect that the love that flows from God's Spirit is going to be superior to our own natural love that we may have for our earthly families. And the blessings that we, that we receive from being in fellowship with one another are what we can look forward to in eternity. But it only works if we have that type of relationship with each other, right? And that is the rub, as Shakespeare said. All right. All right, now I know I've been talking for a while here, and I know there's probably some people in here who are saying to themselves, oh, but Pat, Riverwalk is different. And I'll agree with you to a point, okay? There is a core. No, let me say it a different way. There are many cores within different fellowships, within different congregations. There are cores of people that, are, that come together and become closer. And this is true, like I said, in any congregation. And, and let's just, I mean, as you look around the room, let's just be honest, okay? In many respects, I'm preaching to the choir here, right? There are people that naturally put more time into church, who, who have a bigger idea of what church should be, who spend more time with their church families, and it is true that everybody here can probably point to somebody within this congregation that they feel closer to. And just based on where you're sitting at your tables, your different tribes, some of that comes out, right? You can find the people that you feel closer to, and those are the people that you, that you tend to join. I know in my own personal situation here at this church, there's probably about five families that I feel closer to, but I have to be honest with you, I haven't fully gone over to this Acts 2 idea, even with those people, right? Um, and even if I had, even if all of us had, with our small groups, that would still mean that there were probably about 95% of the people within this congregation that we have no better than a Sunday morning passing in the hallway relationship with. How you doing? I'm great. Thanks. Moving on. All right? And that's not family. That's not family. So that's what we have to think about 
as we think about what it means to be Jesus in the modern world. Now, even as I say all that, I know even if it's just a passing Sunday morning greeting, there's not a shirt on a back here in this, in this room that wouldn't come off if somebody was in need, right? And that's great all on its own. That's great on, all on its own. So, um, but the statistics don't lie, all right? And here's some anecdotal evidence, right? When I attended here in the 1980s at Central, you couldn't find a seat in the auditorium. It was full. But that's not the case today. And we're not alone in our congregation here in Wichita. Okay? You can find seats in just about every building in Wichita on Sunday morning if you're looking for a space to fill. Because that is one way that we like to figure out whether or not we're doing good, right, as a church, right? We're counting meat in the seat, right? So, but, but is that really what we're after? Is attendance really what we need to be looking at? I want to propose to you that attendance should not be our goal. Our goal should not be meat in the seat. Our goal should be to grow the church body by living like Jesus and showing Jesus to the world, and so people want to naturally be here. All right? So it's the end result. It's not the goal of getting, getting the people here because it depends on why they're here. All right? If people are only here filling seats because they're scared or uh, because they've been forced to come here or because any number of other reasons, it's not a good reason for them to be here and they're not getting anything out of being part of this church body. But we have to show them what that means. And we need to stop this idea that attendance is a mark of our success or our lack of success, right? So meet in the seat or, if you want to say it nicer, you in the pew. <laughs> that should flow from doing other things. So maybe we need to change our metrics, right? So think about these as some metrics maybe we could look at as a church. What if, instead of attendance, we looked at the fact that just passively showing up on Sunday morning to listen to the sermon and to maybe come to a class and being there every time the doors are open, that that doesn't make us an active member of the church. What if we were looking out for each other in our family and taking care of the spiritual well-being of our family instead of relying on our elders and our paid staff to do those kinds of things? What if that was a metric for our success? What if we didn't rely on programs and events and services, what if we didn't try to make people come into this building because they're a customer of ours? But what if we just showed Jesus to the world and it made them want to come? What if, instead of saying church every time we're talking about a building or a meeting, that we made church be a big C church and it became us instead? And how would all of this be different if we just picked the parts of Acts 2 that we could do to start with? And what would that look like if we started showing each other that same kind of fellowship, hospitality, and love that's described in Acts 2? If we began to do these things, then the church and Riverwalk could truly begin to be different. All right, so I know, two bells. That means everybody should have got up and left. All right, now we'll see if you come back next week. That's what I'm like. All right, so to, to wrap this up, let's just let's talk about this a little bit. I feel like 
because we've defined the problem today and haven't gotten much more than defining the problem, that I've given you a gloomy outlook. Right? I don't want to do that. What I do want to say is, is that Christianity, the church, is facing some headwinds. Right? But even with headwinds, sailors can still make it to their destination by tacking and strategically plotting their course and getting there, even if they have headwinds. You can do that. And that's what we need to figure out, is that even through these headwinds, if we don't want to wind up in 2070, being on the reverse side of this, where Christianity is now the minority, we have to figure out what we need to do in order to not make that a reality. In, in actuality, I will tell you, as you look around the world today, I think there is more room for opportunity, and perhaps it's a call to action for us to do this. You look at things that are happening, and I think that there is definitely something going on that is leaving room to show that this, that not just this country, but the world is ready for another one of those big explosions that happened in the church in the 50s, in the 70s, the mini explosion, that the, that the opportunities are there and that the fields are ripe for that kind of thing. But it's only going to be if we decide to be Jesus and start taking those things to the world so that they can see Jesus through us. So I'm just going to tell you, I'm the last person to say that I have this all figured out. And I do want to say that I did start off by saying I don't have this all figured out. But what I hope that I've done is I've planted some seeds with you to think about some of these things. And I will just tell you for me that even though I see these headwinds, it doesn't mean that I am going to be cowed into inaction or that I'm going to be demoralized to the point where I'm not going to do anything about it. Instead, I choose to believe that there are things that we can do as a church that can reverse these trends. But some of that is we have to figure out what that is. And the big answer is we've got to become Jesus. All right. We need to be ready to do our part. So what is our part? For that answer, and many more, you need to tune in next week. <laughs> and so I will be here at the same time. We will see if you will be. Thank you very much for your attendance. Have a great week.